Good evening. We have a quorum. We'll call the planning board meeting to order. And first up for general information. Uh, I we have Matt, Matt Olszewski. Hi, good evening. How are you? Good. Um, so I'm on this meeting regarding 34 Lawrence Plain Road. And uh, it was a property that I purchased earlier this spring as many faces on here. Um, probably already know I had applied for uh, to convert a single family house into a two family, which was approved. Um, however, it's come to my attention that um, an existing garage space um, that's attached to the, the same house of 34 Lawrence Plain Road, um, I need to ask for approval for um, personal use. Approval for what? Uh, personal use. I, uh, I met with Tom Quinlan this morning uh, to do a walk around uh, the remodeling that's set to be done and the space that's attached to the two family house, the garage space. Um, uh, he, he thought it would be in my best interest to join tonight's meeting um, to uh, request that that third space uh, be used for personal use. Personal use, you're going to live there? No, no, sir. It's, it's a garage space. So you're going to have an apartment and? and... Uh, so it's going to be an upstairs and a downstairs apartment at 34 Lawrence Plain Road, but there's a third space that's a attached garage to this parcel that uh, I'm asking for permission to use. Please orient me. Where's 34 Lawrence Plain? Approximately. Uh, right across from the what used to be Southern New England Spice Shop, but now okay. is Barati facility. Oh, that's 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 Mitchakoski's property. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, so as I understood what this came up at the development team meeting this afternoon, and as I understood it, you do have a special permit from the ZBA to convert a single family dwelling to a two family dwelling. Yes. And then I understood that you wanted to have a commercial use there too. Um, it's, it's, it's a space that's off of the, the house that, uh, again, I'm just asking to, uh, I guess, have permission to use it as a commercial space. Yes. Uh, it, it is a commercial, uh, property that I believe was um, within the setback. Uh, but again, I'm new to all this. I'm not into real estate. I'm not a developer. I'm just trying to play by the rules and go by the books and kind of follow the advice of people that are, are helping me through the process. Okay. So you're in the local business district. Business, many business uses are allowed, although it would depend on what you were actually going to use it for storage for your um, business yeah storage of for what what, what kind of you're also in the aquifer so storage for what okay tom tom quinlan is just just joining us so What will the space be used for storage for what kind of business, Matt? Um, just my own personal belongings, tools, uh, perhaps leftover building material for the house renovation. It's just it's it's just space, um, just garage space, more or less. Um, there is probably a hundred and fifty square foot uh, office that's above the garage that uh, I could see myself kind of claiming to be left alone and go to use for, for personal use. Um, that's, that's, that's really all I got. I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any plans to, to, to tell you what I'm going to use it for other than just storage for whatever. No toxic chemicals or anything like that. If you're no. using it for store, are you, are you, what is your, what is your business? Four Seasons Property Maintenance. 
Okay, so you own the four seasons, you own the property maintenance. Okay. All right. Yes. I live almost across the field from you. Yes. Okay. I mean, for the property maintenance stuff, for that kind of a that kind of a business is permitted, no problem. So you can use it as as storage for your business as a matter of right. Okay, you don't need any special permits that I'm aware of for that, for using that, because you are, like Mr. Dwyer says, you are in the local business district. If you start storing chemicals or something like that there, that's a different story. Okay. But for just tool storage and whatever you might use it for, for your landscaping business, um, office space, that's not a problem. That's it. Yeah. Nothing, nothing more, nothing less. Oh, are you actually running your business from there? I'm. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Are you actually running your business off of the out of that property? Thirty six Lawrence Plain Road, the parcel out back, but not the house. Not thirty four Lawrence Plain Road. There's basically going to be an extenuation of. Is that you actually have two parcels there, thirty four and thirty six? Yes. I wasn't aware of that. I thought it was all one parcel. You know, I remember that Randy Iser came in some years ago and there was a, <clears throat> a little quirk in the subdivision rules about uh, doing an approval not required plan of existing structures where they don't have frontage per se. Okay. Um, it was the only time I can recall that we came up with that particular one. Yeah, probably because it was so old and been here since the 40s or something, 50s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, you, yeah, you're, it, you, maybe it might be a bit of a stress to call it extenuation, but because they are all on a, basically the same property, even though it is a little quirk of the law, um, you know, you're, you're just running your business basically out of two different buildings on the same property. So okay. I don't think you need anything else from us. Do you, do the rest of the board feel anything? No. If, if, I agree. if you wanted to rent it out to someone who is going to, I don't know, sell shoes there or something like that, then you would want to bring that back to us. Yeah. If you, yeah. if you start running a retail business where you actually have customers coming to see you, on yep. a regular basis might be a different story, but if you're just going to run your business, you're all set. It's it's simply just storage and nothing nothing more. No okay. no retail, no one coming and going, just just storage. You're doing an awful lot of work on that house, I see. I'm running out of money though. Anybody have any I can borrow? <laughs> <laughs> it's coming, it's come a long <laughs> way. Um and uh I'm I'm looking forward to the next few months with uh rehabbing the inside okay was it the original kitchen the original kitchen uh there's some there's some leftover spoons and knives and forks if you want them oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, no i mean the bones are good but it's just dated and as you know neglected over the years so um you know spend this winter working inside and uh come springtime you know some plants and bushes and Make it look nice. We got to keep the neighbors happy, you know. Looks a lot better with those pine trees pulled out from behind it. It does. Uh, it really <laughs> opened it up and let the building breathe. Um, you know, we had everything from red squirrels and raccoons living inside the walls, and uh, it's it's uh, it's a work in progress. That's all I can say. Okay. Well, good, good luck. All right. Thank you. So, um, as far as uh, paperwork or sign off on anything any anything i need to do no there, there i mean if tommy has any questions you can give bill or myself a call but basically you're permitted use in a permitted zone and there's nothing special required for it okay thank you everyone okay well, good night good night next mr dwyer uh next is jenny franz hi everybody hello uh my name is Jenny Franz, and I'm the founder of Better Together Dog Rescue. I know that um, my organization was brought up in the department head meeting last week or the week before, um, but 
I wanted to pop in tonight and introduce myself, let you know what we're looking to do and um, get any opinions and feelings on it. Um, uh, we are currently looking at two lots that are for sale on North Branch off of uh, Cemetery Road. There are two parcels that are being sold by two different owners, uh, but they are right across the small dirt road from each other. Um, one is currently a wooded lot, mainly wooded lot, and one is a, a flat lot. Um, both have said that they are have been perked and are building lots. However, when I stopped in and, and talked to Dee Dee in the office the other day, the frontage is only 150. Um, both parties have said that they've been grandfathered in, uh, but at this point, I'm not 100% sure how to prove that, who proves that, and where we find out that information. Um, so ultimately, I'm looking to, I run this dog rescue, and I'm looking for a place to build uh, my community-based dog shelter. Um, it will be a place where we do house and rescue and adopt out dogs, but it will also be a place for the community to come in and to engage, and we'll also be supporting them through vaccine clinics, mobile food pantry, free store, um, and working with the local senior centers, survival centers um, to support our community that way. So, um, so that's kind of the overall idea of what we're looking to do. And um, Hadley's always been the place that I've wanted to do this. This has been a long time coming. So I've been looking with my realtor, um, Luke Dunn, who's on the call, you know, to try to find the right place to do it um, so that we're not putting anyone in the community out, um, but we're not, um, you know, totally off, off the beaten path. So I welcome any uh, questions or comments that you might have. Okay, a couple of general questions. If they are, if those lots have been there and they only have, the existing frontage, they may very well be grandfathered. Okay. Maybe. We'd have to see a plot plan to verify that. The other comment that I have is I'm not sure this is your this is not a business zone. Correct. And I'm you I'm not positive you would be a permitted use by right in that area. Are you a nonprofit? I am a nonprofit organization, yes, and would be applying for a special permit with the ZBA. So the, uh, the bylaw does allow kennels and vet, veterinary offices in the uh, agricultural residential district by special permit from the ZBA. Okay. So I figured this is, this is pretty much a kennel. Right. Yes. How many dogs at one point in time do you think you'll have there? The current plans are for 16 kennels. Okay. Yeah. I mean, unless until we actually were to see some kind of a plot plan of the properties, we really can't answer your question definitively to say there's grandfather or not. Okay. okay. So I don't know what it would take to get some kind of a plan, a plot plan or whatever it might be. Okay. I mean, okay. If, um, I'm not sure if, if they have anything in the registry of deeds or not for you. There may be also a question of, um, uh, when, if they were ever in common ownership, or I should say, if they were never in common ownership, <clears throat> they're probably both grandfathered. If they, you said one is sufficient frontage and one is not? I think that they're both 150, if I remember correctly. Um, the request did, is did you, I see that you're looking to, to speak. Do you have a, a comment on that? Yeah, well, so, what, so with the properties, there's two different properties and they're actually across the street from each other. So one is owned by Jeff Mish, which then the town has owns the, the piece of property right behind it. So that has 150 frontage. The one across the street is owned by Dennis Pip. And um, the thing with that one is Dan from the assessor's office believes also is that it was, uh, you can tell if you look on the map that it was subdivided, it was, you know, divided up. So that's why there is, there's the question that he believes 
that it may not be grandfathered in, but we're not 100% sure. Okay. Do we know when it was when it was divided? Well, he said by looking at the the way it's numbered, because um, he said normally it would be like, I think that one is 48. So, but there, then the one that's in front of it, that's on, um, is that Cemetery Road, I believe, on the corner, it's a house. I believe that's 48A. So he said that was after a certain time frame. So that's the thing is okay. whether or not it was grandfathered in. Yeah, the subdivision there would not have affected the frontage because uh, it is a long parcel going be between Cemetery Road and North Branch. Mm -hmm. So the part that was uh, cut off on the south side where the house is has 150 feet of frontage and that shouldn't um, have any effect on the north side, which has 150 feet as well. Uh, it couldn't have been made more non-conforming or, or less non-conforming. So what Jen's plan is, is that on the piece of property that's owned by Greg, I mean by um, Jeff Mish, is that's where she'd like to put the kennel, uh, you know, just where the dogs will be in the kennel. That's where the and then across the way is where she wants to put the building that's owned by Dennis. So you want to own both? It's, you want sorry, to buy just, both parcels? Yes. So I want to buy both parcels. But um, just to correct that a little bit, the building with the kennels, it will be one building including kennels. Um, the idea was to put that on Dennis's property. Right. And then the, the plot across the street um, would be more of a fenced in area you know we would leave a lot of the trees up but we would fence it in and have that more of a, the outdoor dog play area um so the intention is not to build on that site um possibly to bring electric and plumbing out there uh but not actually put a building um you know that being said it depends on you know what these lot looks like if it turns out that it's better for us to build on five instead of 48 then we can you know swap things around but because 48 is so flat and cleared it just seemed to make a little more sense to put the building on that lot but we're we're totally you know able to switch things around if necessary okay so here is 48 and that is what dennis and sandy own um and here is five up here so that's the relation of the parcels and this is the portion that was cut off of 48 but that made it no more non-conforming so i think that that probably is not going to be an issue okay. The only thing to be be aware of is that if outdoor noise for the dogs, you're you're not far away from a lot of houses. Right. Where's so, where is the uh, uh, the town dump? Oh, you took by, took by six. Six. Yeah. right over there. Yeah. Uh, so now, Bill, um, the lot onto the right number that's number six, Nick, uh, Jeff's property. Um, is there enough frontage on that one that he can actually, because uh, it was just bought to build a house on it? So that has 110 feet of frontage, but um, it would depend on when, if ever, it was in common ownership with number six. And I actually have an update on that property. Um, I did speak to um, Mr. Steinbeck and he, as far as he told me on the phone, he doesn't have plans to build a house there. He simply bought it as a buffer. So there, is there gonna be any living? Uh, is there town water there? I don't think there is. No. No, it would be well and septic. Are there any river setbacks or anything under CONCOM? 
that's within the dike. So it probably doesn't have any issues, but you'd want to talk with them to be sure. Okay. Let's see, this is trying to see if I can. Uh, yes, but, yeah. This, I can't figure out how long this dimension is, but it, it seems to be well set back from the river anyway, if it wasn't behind the dike. Okay, well, this was all very helpful. Does anybody have any other questions for me? And I will work on getting plans and reaching out to the people that I need to, um, including the abutters, assuming that my offers go through on the, the properties. We've got to do that first. But, um, you know, I'm just trying to stay ahead of the curve here. My, my I, wife. My wife just adopted three dogs down in Bogota, Colombia, which thrills me to no end, but I think you're going to have a volunteer if you just go through. <laughs> oh, that would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, we have a great foster base, um, but we're, we're eager to get this building up so that we can, we can not only help more dogs, but also get the community um, involved and supported as well, so... Bill, will, she, will she need a special permit to uh, put the kennel there? Yes. You're from the ZBA, yes. From ZBA. So, uh, well, you're not going to give legal advice, but uh, nevertheless, uh, if you buy the property and then you get shot down by the ZBA or the neighbors, uh, that wouldn't be too, too. Yeah. I mean, both of my offers included the contingency that I get the ZBA permit. Okay. Yeah protect protect the organization's money in that case so okay yes very good all right well thank you all for taking the time to speak with me and um see you next time okay, okay. all right thank you. thank you uh next up is dan wilga by the way, there were some questions in the comments. Uh, I have been logging people in as they uh, appeared in the waiting room and you're being called in the order you appeared in the waiting room. Good evening, folks. Good evening. Uh, I'm Dan Wilgo from 11 Birch Meadow Drive. And uh, I'm I've contracted with uh, Empower Energy Solutions to build a small scale ground mount solar array uh, on my property. And uh, first, I'm not positive there may actually be another representative from the company here because they they actually told me that uh, this meeting was happening and that they were going to ask questions. If they are, go ahead and make yourself known. If not, I'll ask my question. Um, I had been told sort of a third in a third hand way by them that uh, the town was going to require that a fence be installed around the solar array. And uh, I looked through the town bylaws and I can't find any mention of that requirement. And I was wondering if I could get some uh, uh, where, justification and specifications. Where are you located again? 11 Birch Meadow Drive. Okay. You do not need a fence around the property unless the neighbors make a lot of noise about it, but you do need a special permit from the planning board for a ground mounted solar. Okay. Well, if it's small scale, it's an administrative review. It, um, if it's large scale, yes, you would need a special permit. Right, right. What's the uh, break point between small and large scale? Uh, well, it is in the definitions but uh, your contractor should know this, but uh, let me... Uh, More than uh, likely, you're gonna be small scale. Okay. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be pretty big to be large scale. That's, that's what I had figured. But let's get you the right number. All right. Uh, 
do, 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 do. It is uh, Article uh, Section 28 of the Zoning Bylaw. And mm -hmm. uh, as I scroll through this, we may have moved some of the definitions. We moved some of the definitions out of the bylaw and into the front. So that's right. We're getting, this was a change we just made. Um, okay. So uh, definitions are in section 1.2. And um, solar energy. Um, uh, so uh, I guess small scale is defined by not being large scale. So a large scale has its solar panel structurally mounted on the ground that occupies a footprint equal to or greater than one acre, but no more than 10 acres. Oh, okay. So That's a small a scale is less than one acre. Okay. Thank you. That's a lot of solar. That would be. How big is your panel? How big is your system proposed to be? uh i it's probably about uh 30 by 30 feet no no in, in terms of kw um i actually don't know the number i i wouldn't i couldn't say off the top of my head okay i'd have to i'd have to look in the documentation i have so 30 by 32 that's a deep, that's a good size system it is we use way too much power <laughs> it's probably any order of uh probably somewhere 15 plus kw you're going to buy or lease? No, I'm buying outright. That's a smart way. If you can afford it. Yeah. OK. So right, well, thank you very much for answering the question. Uh, do you have any wait, idea wait, how they wait, might have? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't, don't run away yet. OK. When you at, or is, are ready, either you or your developer will need, your solar installer will need to come to a planning board meeting for an informal review. That takes about a month plus. Okay. okay. Simply the way the bylaw is written, that we give like 45 days of review, I think it is. And so you can plan on that and you're when you actually are ready to allow for that when you're ready to start initiating everything else so that you don't get delayed any more than you need to be. And that's before getting the building permit or yes, yes. That's that's part of the best and the requirement of a small scale solar. That's part of the review, the informal review process. What happens okay. is we take your package and share it with various other town departments, such as the fire department, conservation commission, and see if we get any comments back from them. And then only after we have shared it can we conduct the administrative review. So to the best of your knowledge, there hasn't been any uh they There's haven't been gone no through this no application yet. yet, correct. Okay. Okay, here we All go. Right. 30 with the uh I just found that it's in the 20 section 28.6.3 interdepartment mm -hmm. review. There's a 35 day period. So for the time that your developer or you would apply for the informal review. We have a 35 day, so a little over a month, almost a month and a half before you get a, an approval out of us. Okay, so you can just don't figure that into the into your project. Okay, to allow for it. Okay. So. All right. Yep. I see. I have the bylaws here in front of me, so I can I can see that too now. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you. And next up, we have Mickey Marcus. Uh, hey, everybody. It's good seeing all of you again. Uh, another solar project question. So um, the Nexamp solar project, which is on Allard's Farms, uh, Wayne Gillet's property behind the Hampshire Mall, is built. It's all been signed off on. Uh, they, uh, the Nexamp would like to add battery storage backups to each of the two pro projects. Um, they do have approval from the fire chief. They have approval from the conservation commission. Um, 
And it's possible that the planning board's already approved this minor plan change back in May 2017, but we don't have any written record of that. So I just wanted to let you know, so what they want to do is put in um, um, a new concrete pad to put this battery storage. Uh, it will require underground cables and it will require a new pole where they interconnect with the utility system. So that's the change. Um, Did we approve the battery storage? Well, I actually, you just said 20, 2017. Is that when you think that was happening? Oh, I'm sorry, it was 2019. 2019. May, it, 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 in May 2019, um, I believe we came before the planning board. I just don't have any written record of it. So I did find the minutes for May of 2019, and I didn't see you there. Okay, then 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 we're going to start again because that, that I just want to make sure um, you know what NextAmp would like to do. Okay, and go ahead, keep going. So um, basically, the energy companies get a little more money for their solar projects if they add a battery storage back up. So when the planning board first approved the project, there was no battery storage. What they want to do is put a battery in each of the two projects, which is within the footprint of the solar project. So the footprint of the project is the same. And if you would allow me, I'm, I'm happy to share a screen and just show you that. Okay. Got that. We're talking about the site back behind the mall. Yep. Yeah. And it's actually two separate projects behind the mall. It's um, um, there. There are two. There are two fields. They're each ten acres a little less than 10 acres. And um, it's all built, it's all vegetated, it's all done. Uh, what they wanna do within the solar fence line of the solar project is add um, a battery. It's about 40 feet long. So it needs a concrete pad 40 feet long. It's like a, it looks like a storage unit. You've probably seen these already. Um, the so in 2000, okay. What's the legal address? Um, well, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure I know. There's uh, one yes. entrance off of Westgate Center Drive and the other entrance is off of um, South Maple Street. It's both, they're both landlocked parcels, so it doesn't have a street number. Okay. Um, actually, I just found it. Um, August 6th of 2019. Uh, next amp, Hadley 3, North and South with Valerie Miller. Wants to add battery storage, um, have okay from fire chief. Um, uh, we voted four zero with one absent. Uh, Jim, you were out. I remember that. Why you don't remember it. Uh, okay. We voted four zero. Uh, uh, the motion was to allow uh, to amend site plan approval to allow battery storage installation at both sites as shown on plans. And uh, uh, Mark, you asked if we should be looking more into the safety aspects. My reply was, if the fire chief is okay, what else do we bring to the table? <laughs> and um, with that, we voted to, uh, to approve it for four zero. Okay. No, I, I I wasn't there, unfortunately. I have some questions. Explain about this battery backup. So it's um, basically what happens is when the solar project produce. I'll, I'll just show you where it. Is. Can you see this plan? Yes. Uh, this is the battery storage proposed here. This is the project that goes to Westgate Center. The next plan is uh, the southern field. Here's the battery storage. Um, so when the solar project uh, produces electricity, um, some of that power just goes into the battery. And then after sunset, um, they can release that power to the grid. It, it's just, uh, is that what you're talking about or do you want more information? 
Yes, wait a minute. But that, that's all basically, I'm not, I don't care about, I know how the system works regarding that. I want to know details of these batteries. Are sure. these dry, these are dry cell liquid cooled batteries? Um, you, you know, the specifications were given to the fire chief. Um, I can dig those up and give those to you. I, I don't have them at my fingertips. Those are utmost important. And I will tell you why. Most of these battery backups are glycol cooled systems using antifreeze. You are in the aquifer. You will not be permitted to use ethylene glycol in these battery systems unless it is an enclosed building in an enclosed spill containment period. If you use propylene glycol, the requirements are a little bit less because ethylene glycol is toxic. Yep. And you are in the aquifer. And if a spill occurs, enough said, because there's no containment for preventing it from going into the ground, except it's in a container, but the container is what could rupture. Okay, so I will not approve this tonight until I find out a lot more detail about these battery systems, because we have another public hearing coming up in the middle of and our second meeting in January that is only a battery storage system for solar. So um, we're getting more of these requests. This one is also in the aquifer and they've already been told that they can't use ethylene glycol unless, but that'll come over out the public hearing. But I want to let, I just want to inform you about the potential watchouts that we have on this system because you are in our aquifer. So yeah, understood. Yeah. And I, I, one of the, uh, if I could, uh, that, that may not be in the aquifer. The aquifer cuts through Mountain Farms Mall, but it sort of goes right down the uh, structure line of, of the westerly line of the target wall. And this is uh, where That's Staples is. Mentioned. This is where the, um, the solar is down here. Westgate. Oh, that's a geologic, geologist map, I think. I, uh, I, <laughs> but Mickey brings up a good point, the fact that it's going to be uh, a cement uh, pad. And uh, like any, if there is a potential hazard, it pr probably should be weld and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Rocky Hill Road, No Valley. Okay, I see what you're saying, Bill. I, I will say that the fire chief asked to meet with the uh, battery storage folks and the, um, the installers prior to construction to make sure the system that was used was to his satisfaction and um, the fire suppression system was acceptable. So he proved, you know, there were details given to him, but he asked for additional um, meetings prior to construction. That's 116. So here's, here's the official zoning map. 116 comes down here. Westgate Center goes over here. And the aquifer just comes over to goes through most of Hampshire Mall. Yeah, wh wh where are the two fields? They're right where his cursor is. Yeah, but go that, back. To the, the aquifer map, just to, from a geolog geologist point of view, and Joe Z took rocks for jocks, is that it's not. It's not like this all the way. It varies. It moves. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it's just a judgment call. It's just a judgment call by the geologist. It's, I should, I would like to know where that aquifer actually pinches out. That would be more uh, uh, of interest to us, I think, but we're too late for that. So this is the Allard property off of Westgate Center Drive. Okay. With Right of way access along the back of the mall. Okay, so basically, this the, the the light blue dotted parcel is about the end of the aquifer by our map, Bill. Approximately, I would guess, right? Yes. 
Okay, so this is not in the aquifer. Okay. Okay. If you're not in the aquifer, my comments don't apply to you, except that uh, you might need some kind of a spill containment because we still don't want it going into the ground. But it doesn't have to be inside of a building. Okay. Okay. But, but you still like to know what it's cooled with. Mike, talk about them all, just for our information. The yeah, the you're 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 right on one hand that these aquifer maps were drawn by hydrogeologists to prove whether or not a parcel is in or not in the aquifer lies solely on the discretion of the landowner, and that's usually only in the case that. It's under dispute that they are in the aquifer or not in the aquifer. This one, he's saying he's not in the aquifer. The maps say he's not in the aquifer. And we are by no means any kind of experts to be saying that we disagree with the map here. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's a, I wouldn't call it superhuman effort to prove otherwise, but it's close. It takes, probably at least several good months of some very complicated uh, experiments no, to prove no, somebody is, is or is not in an aquifer region. And I, I've never seen it done. I've had it explained to me how it's done once upon a time and it went way over my head. You, yeah, you gotta... I, I will tell you that during construction on this site, the entire solar parcel was underlain with that uh, varved clay. So it's a very compact, tight soil underneath those two fields. Which is why it's a good place for an aquifer because it's sealed underneath that clay. Yeah. You know, uh, it's the present company accepted. This is like a legal opinion. If we search long enough, we could find a, a geologist that uh, would say that your property is under the over the aquifer. <laughs> yeah. But well, we won't do that. So, so what would the planning board like from well, that? Hey, Nikki, uh, when, when you were saying it's going to be on a, uh, a cement pad, is that uh, just for construction purposes or is it going to be used as a potential welling? In other words, if there is some substantial leak uh, to be contained. <laughs> You know, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the, the details that were originally submitted to the planning board and the fire department showed, um, I think it was a flat pad. I don't think it was a containment pad. Not that it couldn't be built that way. Well, that, that, that uh, would not be much work and it would be probably a little bit more comforting. Okay, no, no I, I hear you. Uh, it sounds like whether it's in the aquifer or not, you're just trying to protect. So basically, you're saying the electric company can make more money selling electricity at night than during the day. They could still sell it. It's an economic decision. I think it's a smart idea, yeah. Yeah. And I think whether we're in an aquifer, which it appears we're not in the aquifer district, we still are adjacent to agricultural farming. So, the, you know, having it contained in the case of an emergency uh, spill makes sense. I know with oil tanks, we aim for 110% containment. I mean, I, I would be satisfied with even like Mr. Z Mr. Zagradik says, either making this, the pad a little bit of a spill containment with some sides or using propylene glycol, either of the two. Okay. I'm not sure which one would be better for the system myself but when you talk to the fire chief he was just looking at the fire aspects of this and not the hazardous waste potential contamination no, they were they were details that were that were sent of the system. Uh, you know, this is two years ago, so I, I just have to check again. But uh, it was the pad, it was the details, 
It was the construction. Um, it was the brand that they were using of the battery. Um, so it, it sounds like we just should get you that information of what they're planning to use. I hate to ask where the batteries are made. Bogota. Yeah. <laughs> they wish. Jim, Tom has a question. Yeah, no, I was with the chief. Um, we may have done prior, but it was about when I started, we met with the prior contractor that was going to do the project. And everything was set with the, um, you know, the connections, the dry connections for the uh, water and, and everything else. But we did not take into account, and I, I'm assuming the, the chief didn't either, whether it was aqua or anything like that. So we didn't take anything in that into account. Yeah, that, that's fine. And we wouldn't expect them to. Right. So you, you're requesting tonight the concrete pads and extra poles for the battery storage? Yeah, I, th I think there are three different components. It, there's a, the concrete pads, um, there's underground cables, and then where the, the battery interconnects with the uh, utility. So at Westgate Center Drive and at um, South Maple Street, there's a, another pole that's needed. Okay, yeah, that, okay. Well, underground connections really wouldn't, we wouldn't have much to worry about that one. It's just the above ground stuff. So since you're not in the aquifer, it makes things much easier for all of us and much simpler. So I will make the following motion. Approve the battery storage and poles and pads, concrete pads for next sample on, on, uh, for their two areas with a condition that, that the concrete pad have either curbs for spill containment or, util or utilize propylene glycol. Their choice. I would second that. What, what does curves mean? I mean, is there a pitch that you want? I mean, it could just be subtle. The, 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 the concrete pad should have some kind of a curb on it for a spill containment. That's the way, that's the, way the motion was worded. That clear enough, Mickey? No, uh, no that's very clear. I, I like. Well, how, how do you, Mickey? How do you read the word curves? I mean, is there a pitch to it? How how deep does it have to be? That's the question. I, I think it's enough to contain whatever the product is that's inside. Right. Yeah, which is essentially can... not a whole bunch. And and was that a or an and or an or on the glycol? Or, or eat curbs or utilize glycol, propylene glycol. It's basically like into a curb. It would be like the foundation wall of the slab would just extend up maybe six, 10 inches, depending on the volume calculated okay. of the maximum potential leakage from the batteries. Everybody all set with that? Yeah, I think if we specify that the curb is for spill containment, right. we are right. set I without I, I, I said how that. much product is in there. Right. With yeah. condition, the concrete pad had curbs for spill containment or it utilized propylene glycol. What, why do we have to have the or? Why don't we just say it's a containment in case there is, in case the batteries leak? Good point. So leave the leave the utilized propylene glycol out and just spill containment. Well, we'd like to know if it's going to be uh, that too. That's true. We could find out in ten years that propylene is almost as bad as you know ethylene. And I think if I was the farmer next door, I'd like to hear that you had spill containment either way. That's what I think, Mark. So, Maybe just so, leave it spill containment and not specify anything else. Propylene glycol. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, but in as much as it's not in the aquifer, we may have to have that clarified for the next one coming up. Okay. So we simply say approve the battery storage and concrete pads and poles with the condition that the concrete pad had curbs for spill containment. Right. That's it, correct? 
Right. Okay. That's the motion. You want to say curves or curvatures? It's curves. Curb. -E. -E. Oh, curves. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. I thought yes. that was where, where I was getting confused. Yeah. I thought you were saying <laughs> curves. <No. laughs> oh, okay. All yeah, right. Hadley accent always gets me. Yeah, <laughs> fine. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Very good. We'll get that later on. I appreciate that. Pardon? I appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And we come to Tom Fancy. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Early. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Mr. Dwyer, I, did you get my plans and stuff? Are we? I do. Is this something you are able to address tonight? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Um, I didn't see it on the agenda, so I was like, oh, no. <laughs> we, don't, we don't require or offer appointments for this phase of the meeting. Okay. So let me get this up. And this is the property we uh, just approved. The uh, access across other than frontage for. Oh, the Handrick property. Yes. Yeah, so this property was kind of weird where Randy Iser had already did a plan, but you guys couldn't find it in the planning board. It wasn't recorded, but the assessors had a lot one created. And I was able to get a plan from Randy Iser of that lot one. Um, and then ultimately we were just adding a little piece to it, parcel A. Creating a CCR over most of lot two, excluding an area up toward the front of Moody Bridge Road. So, the purpose is for the APR for the space. So I'll make a motion to approve this as an ANR plan. Second. Any other discussion? If not. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Will I get? Will you get in touch with me, Bill? So uh, Joe, Jim, and I are authorized individually to sign approved plans on behalf of the planning board. And I think what you did on a prior plan was someone from your office just drove over to my house and I signed the plan. Um, there is also a uh, the form A. I, I think I did forward this around earlier, um, but I will. Uh, got so many letters here. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure the fee because it was there was two lots before, but one wasn't formalized, I guess. And, now it's still two lots, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure how the fees get to the work. So let's see. Um, just trying to find the one that uh, I guess this is the one that has the form A. 
So let me just forward. I, I have forwarded this around, but I'll just uh, shoot this over to you uh, again, Jim. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll take the I'll say take the form A part of it, Bill, and I'll sign and get it back to you with a filing fee. Okay. Then we can give it to them when they ring when you sign the plans. Okay. So you'll be in touch with me then. Yeah, I'll uh, when I get the signed uh, form A back from Jim, I'll send it to you, and then we can make arrangements to uh, meet somewhere to sign. Okay. <clears throat> good. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. too. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. So we had uh, Christopher Dunn in here. I think he was the representative for the other gentleman. Um, oh, for oh for no, the, so uh, for um, Jenny Franz. She said he was the realtor. I think. Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, then no, W. Marrick. No cousin of mine. No, I'm just on the I'm just on the uh, meeting listening. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, that brings up Paul Benjamin. Hi, am I unmuted there? You How are you? Out? Um, I am here. I I thought my attorney's office was going to send somebody to take care of this, and I I believe something happened, and there was a last minute problem. So. Um, as you know, in 2008, we acquired what was called Acrebrook, my wife and I, and put it under a company called Adair Place Properties, LLC. Um, we proceeded, despite the uh, precipitous crash that the uh, housing market took that year, we decided because we had the funds to get the road put in to town specification, uh, we did that. We um, subsequently put the top coat on because we were concerned about what was going to happen to the base if, if we weren't able to get building going in some period of time. And we've been maintaining it ever since. And with family issues and some other things, we've been delayed in doing anything with this property. Um, and we are now at a point where we have signed some uh, purchase agreements uh, and we're trying to close two of them before the end of the year. And what we would like to have done is release um, five of the lots. Uh, two, uh, four of them are for the people who are buying, uh, two builders who are buying two lots each one each this year and one each next year. Um, and the fifth lot would be for my wife and I to build on uh, hopefully this summer or next summer rather. So the lot numbers are two, three, seven, eight, and 10. There are a total of 10 lots there. So you would still have uh, five lots held back. Um, and the only thing that's left to do on any of these lots, uh, as far as I understand from the original uh, sign off on here was that we need to put two trees up uh, on each lot, and we didn't want to do that until the each as each house is finished, we're going to put two trees in based on what's required um, to start the uh, canopy down the street. So I'm um, hopeful you can uh, release those tonight for me. We have a closing scheduled letter this week and uh, also next week. Do we have a, a plan of this bill? I uh, was trying to find one at the Registry of Deeds, and I was having trouble. Um, so bear with me for a minute. Um, what was the name of the subdivision? It was, it was originally called Acrebrook. Okay. Let's try that. And you, you folks signed off on it on... Well, the plan I have in front of me doesn't have that back page on it, but um, it was completely Okay, no, I, I see it now. Right. It's, okay. um, uh, yeah, I was trying to look it up as a dare place, but- Sorry. Uh, Sorry, yeah, we changed the name. You changed the name, so. Okay, uh, let me bring this up and- uh, Okay, let me don't make it easy. Um, I'm at the registry website. Uh, I do have seven pages of plans here. So let me see if I can find an overview. 
Yeah, I think if you went to like the second or third page, you'll see the street with the lot numbers. Uh, yes, third page it is. So let me get this. Okay, <clears throat> I've got it and there we go. Thank you. Okay, so again, it was, if I may, it's seven, eight, two and three and lot 10. Now there is, there is a difference between this plan. There's another plan filed on top for lots 10 and five which you approved as an administrative change. We, uh, previously, lot five was two, approximately two acres. It's now one acre. And the uh, back section of lot five is now part of lot 10. Um, just about where the number five is, if you drew a vertical line there, it's approximately that much land went over to 10. And all the back parcel, which was, um, you, you did an administrative approval to have that be part of lot 10 which is now approximately 16 acres. And that's the one we're gonna build our house on. Okay, I'll pull that one up in a second then. Okay. And, and if we can't do lot 10 tonight, I'd love to do this tonight so we can just get at least these released at this time. Um, lot 10 is not as big a deal. We could come back in this, you know, first quarter or something, but I just thought while we're here, might as well get that done too. Are there going to be any specifications as to what type of house will be built? Yes, we, we have uh, covenants, which have, I think are being filed either today or tomorrow. Um, there's a street uh, maintenance agreement as well. Um, and, um, you know, we're looking for either farmhouse, bungalow style um, houses. Um, we have, you know, very typical covenants that, you know, most developments have um, requiring, you know, care and upgrade, uh, keep of the front lawns and so on. And, um, things like that. The, pretty much the basic boilerplate stuff. Oh, oh Mike Serzinski here. Hi. Uh, Hi. Subsequent to this approval being given for the subdivision, Hadley created what was it's known as the Affordable Housing Trust. Uh -huh. uh, so you are grandfathered in. <laughs> yes. Okay. But if you're Beneficent says you'd like to contribute something, we'd certainly welcome it. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll take that's that under good. advisement, but that's I have good. to tell you, as, as you can know, if you just do the math, we've been holding this property since 2008. We have sure. paid it off. We, um, you know, I've maintained it. I've been doing, uh, you know, crack repair on the streets to make sure that the street doesn't deteriorate and I've kept it mowed and um, I'm, I'm in need of moving this forward at this point. Got it, no problem. I just wanted you to know, that's yep. all, thanks. Okay, so here is the uh, revised yes, lot five revised. and mm -hmm. the lot 10. Yep. Okay, I'll make a motion to release lots two, three, seven, eight, and 10. Second. A motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. I abstain because I'm in a butter. So the motion is four zero with one abstention. Motion passes. Thank, thank you very much for your time tonight and uh, stay safe, everybody. Thank so, you. Um, Merry Christmas to anybody who celebrates and Happy New Year to the rest of you. I <laughs> will let uh, Tom Reedy know that we have approved this. I did get an email from him that yep. uh, the... Uh, you, you really stressed out the uh, Amherst office because um, <laughs> uh, everybody had another commitment except for yes. this poor guy who uh, uh, has been at a COVID testing site all day. And that's what I heard. And seen. Yeah, I didn't want I didn't want to disclose that, I, uh, you, but that's okay. And uh, I'm just uh, thank you very much for allowing me to do this. And um, again, thank you for your work. Where do you live now, Paul? We we uh, we live on at thirty five Newton Lane. Oh, okay. We're the, we're, we're we're there, and um, uh, you know we love that house also. But um, you know we've had this land, and we really wanted to 
get out there and, you know, with uh, aging parents that we were taking care of, we, we used to take care of my wife's uh, mom, dad, and her aunt. They were all, when we started in their 80s, they, the last one survived to 95, a few days short of 95th birthday, I think. And mm-hmm. so we used to say we ran a uh, un- unlicensed assisted living center for them. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we had a house rehabbed and uh, we took care of them. It was a, just a, almost a full-time job on top of our full-time jobs. Um, but they, they had a very nice life here and loved Hadley very much. Uh, is it yeah, fair to ask uh, the, uh, the sale price for the lots? Because uh, that was two questions that uh, I had people ask before it appeared in the paper. Well, um, a range, a range, I should range. Say. Uh, the lots uh, start from 140 and go to about 190,000, depending on where they are okay. on the property. Okay. There's some with better views and location. Okay. All right. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. So, uh, we had uh, W. Merritt leave and Walt, ret- Walt show up. So same person? Or- Walt's left. Walt's left Mr. too. Mr. Okay. Comia, you were up. Welcome. Thank you for being patient, Kim. Of course, as always. Uh, How's the board? We had a busy yeah, session tonight busy. before you. I was like, whoa. <laughs> all the people, Philip, all the people on, our, on our Zoom call looked like a Selectwoods meeting. There was so many. I know. I was like, this is the, the last meeting of the year, and you guys have a lot of uh, items or, or, you know, a lot Nobody of people. wants to get their closings in for the end no. of the year. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think where we left off board um, is, you know, we are still continuing to talk about these regulations, um, particularly what would be adopted by the planning board. You have your open public hearing. Um, and so, you know, my suggestion in the email to you today was to explore and figure out how you wanted to finalize the regulations. Um, the board is aware that they that the uh, that a bylaw was passed last year. Um, so right now, you don't have any regulation to suggest where, um, if there were payments in lieu of affordable units. Um, how those would be calculated. So, you know, I think we've been working through a draft um, and it hasn't changed since the last time um, that we discussed it. What I gave to the board this afternoon was that example because we had a spirited conversation at the last meeting about looking at the inclusionary bylaw, uh, inclusionary zoning bylaw for units under six. Um, So I think that's, that's a conversation that's longer term, um, but I, you know, I'm here at the at the board's pleasure with regards to how to address the regulations, or you know, and and trying to move forward on a possible exploration of your incl- inclusionary zoning um, bylaw, and if that is going to be amended at some point. Um, I think also acknowledging that in that email that I sent to the board. Um, The district local technical assistance um, emails, I think, may have gone out um, to the commissioners and to um, municipal officers of the of the communities in the region. Um, So to think about that, and I know that conversation has occurred um, with regards to looking at a housing production plan for the town and definitely ideas like inclusionary zoning um, probably would be explored at that. Um, so that's just context since the last meeting, um, and I don't know how the board wants to move forward um, with regards to the regulations that we've been working on. Well, my only comment is that approaching the problem from the direction of construction right. is just causing the price of housing to go up because it's just going to be passed on to whoever's building or buying the house. And my thought, as you guys know, from the previous meeting we were at concerning this is to put it on the other end, put it on the end of the sale. And that way it would be really inclusionary. It would be efficient, inclusionary, and fair. And everybody would have uh, an interest in, in this. Doing it our way is just causing the price of housing to go up and which is contrary to what we're trying to do. Okay, that's that's my pitch. 
How does that vary, Mike? The sale, which sale? You mean the sale of the property to the developer? No, any sale in town, any sale. Uh, okay. Similar to what Boston has proposed, Bill, if you correct, and uh, I think in New York City, but I just, I just think we're doing it our way. It's scatterbrained. We don't know what's going to be coming in. Not that you you can predict the sales of properties in town, but I think it would be a little more consistent flow into the housing trust r rather than trying to get it on the front end with developers. And there's ways to game the system. So to, to recap, if I'm recalling correctly, what what Mike's leaning towards is is sort of a uh, an an exit tax, a sales tax. You know, some portion of the sale price of every property would be diverted to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Right, a smaller right. a smaller number off of every sale, as opposed to a larger percentage off of a developer's sale. So, is it a tax? That, that would That's be nice if it was legal. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I don't well, know. you know, the Supreme Court that decided the Obamacare tax wasn't really a tax. So, uh, you know, we may have some leeway here. Well, and I, I think the, the point is that, and I forget who mentioned it, in, this in, is being explored as an option at the state level. Yeah. Which would make it legal. Um, but, you know, we're, uh, we're pretty far down the food chain from the... Um, the entities that are well actually no we we do have some we've been to training seminars with i think some of the entities that are pushing this as a concept well i did, it is a concept and for a republican like me to propose propose something like this is really extraordinary <laughs> so uh we can put it on the back burner we can put something else in place but i really do think it's more efficient we don't have to do any crazy calculations. We don't have to do any guesses and it's equitable. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on the sale price. It can be the sale price less any uh, mortgage on the property, okay? I, I think we're all in agreement with your idea, Mike. It's just a matter of right now, we don't have the authority to do that. No, I know. Um, so okay, we're, gonna deal with, we're gonna deal for the time being with what we have and hopefully within the not too distant future, we can implement the other, your idea. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Does you know, anybody I, have any problem with the concept? I'm just curious. Oh, no. Well, as always, the devil is in the details, but yeah. I think if, if it were relatively modest, it would nevertheless produce a healthy stream of revenue based on what properties are selling for. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it usually was only a, you know, a half a percent or something that, that over the course of a few years, that could be some serious money. You know, if we look at what's before us, we don't see any stream of revenue coming into the trust. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. No. Yeah, I think, you know, that's definitely a strategy that, that the, that the town can em, employ once that particular legislation, you know, goes through whatever process. And I, I, you know, I brought that up to the attention of the board at the last meeting was that they were looking at this legislation in September. Um, I don't know what's going to be the life of it. I'm not very familiar with um, that particular, um, but I did reach out to um, one of the housing advocates um, and they're just saying that, yes, we, that, that's something that we're following and hope, you know, and advocating for. Um, uh, and so I think that, you know, understanding that, and as, as um, Jim had suggested, that's definitely something um, the, the, within the details of the legislation, that if the town were to adopt that and have the ability to utilize those funds to support affordable housing and putting it into the trust fund, um, that they could do that. And you could repeal, you know, the regulations um, with regards to payment in lieu if you chose to do that. Um, 
the inclusionary zoning bylaw, I think, also has been, we've been talking about this, this, um, and, you know, and the resources that I provided for you um, earlier today do suggest that there are towns that have adopted this for residential development, that a portion of, um, of those units because you know your inclusionary zoning goes up to starts at six six units and above um, that for those units two to five if that happens to be what's being developed that there would be some sort of payment into the trust fund um, just based on an adoption of of a new inclusionary zoning bylaw um, there's also options as um, you all may be aware, um, and it's probably more likely in, um, in Eastern Mass, but linkage, and that's tying affordable housing to the development of non-residential development. Um, so, you know, if any commercial would require some sort of, for lack of a better term, impact fee. Um, is that something that the town wants to explore? That, that again, you know, that's, that's something that's, really, that's an option. That's really making it complicated. And... Right, right, right. I, I think the simpler is the better. And yeah. definitely if, you know, if the board is in favor of this legislation that I mentioned at the last meeting, um, you know, it's just keeping that, that close to you and understanding that that may be around the corner. Um, but at the same time, if there happens to be additional residential development um, that you'll want to address payment in lieu of um, if that's, you know, like two or three years down the line or, you know, even longer. Um, Ken, what does development mean? Uh, you, you were here for the previous discussion with Mr. Benjamin and he subdivided all that and he's selling off the lots and every person is going to be able to build their own house and get their own contractor. So, well, I think the way that it may have um, been addressed in the past um, based on a previously approved definitive subdivision um, was that you may have had the discussion if there happened to be, and I don't know the history of that particular development, if that was before your inclusionary zoning by was, was, yeah. Okay. Um, but if you were to take it at face value and that came in today, um, you know, for a 10 unit, you would have to utilize the the inclusionary zoning bylaw that you have in the books at the moment, um, and if the um, who proposal pays, who pays it, Benjamin? I mean, the the developer, even though he's selling the lots off, that would he's be not at the developing beginning. them. He's selling them off. That would be at the beginning when you're negotiating and navigating the um, the ability to for him to develop according to the zoning bylaw, which would kick in the inclusionary zoning. He would be required to, if there was a development over six units, um, either pay in lieu of or provide a unit. Um, but that's something that, you know, would kick in based on how much, how, so, how many homes were in the development. Yeah, so what if he, excuse me, go ahead, Bill. That's exactly what we have with uh, colony estates going on, that the developer um, has, I think it's seven, seven or eight lots, which triggered the requirement for one affordable unit, um, which he could either build on site, provide an affordable unit elsewhere in town, or theoretically pay into the uh, uh, do a payment in lieu if we could get our act together. But as part of the approval process, we told him that we were going to retain two lots in Covenant, one for the completion, due completion of the road, and one for compliance with inclusionary zoning. And we were getting close to the point, I think, six of the eight lots are now sold or under contract, which leaves two lots. So we're gonna to have to deal with this one way or the other sooner rather than later, or at least it's gonna 
come up. But at the same time, this is the only development that has triggered uh, inclusionary zoning since we adopted the bylaw in, um, and I don't remember exactly when we adopted it, but I can answer that. I can answer my own question. Um, um, Uh, age of development. So like 12 or something. 2006. 2006. Okay. So in 14 years, we've only had one subdivision to trigger this, which may be, I'm not sure what that tells us, but um I suppose you can make the argument that we didn't we maybe should have set the threshold even lower because projects some subdivisions have gone in just not very big ones and bill the developer has to pay into the trust even if he's selling off the lots and not developing the property yes because it's done up the negotiation is up front before we approve it, Mike. It's based on the number of lots the original developer develops. And it's up to that developer to do one of the things that Bill mentioned, provide a, a, provide a unit, build a unit, or pay into it. But just from the builder's developer's perspective, selling a lot is a lot perhaps less profitable than building something and selling the whole caboodle. So it, the way it's worded is the original developer is the one for, to be responsible for this. Yeah. I mean, we got to make somebody, we can't pass it off down the yeah, line, down the line, but down the, the line. The point is the money's being made on the, on the building the house, not on selling the lot. And we're not getting anything out of that. Well, listen, We've been on this so long. If somebody makes a motion, I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's at, technically at the moment, we have not reopened the public hearing yet. Yeah. So there's nothing to vote on. Um, <laughs> Ken, do you think, so the, um, the notification of DLTA grants came out today? I believe so. Um, I yes, was yes. forwarded a copy. Yes. Yes, I I re received it and shared it with the um, with the rest of the board. Um, and under the heading, I, we don't know when uh, applications are due by. I, I think what historically has happened, having been through um, this, would be my third DLTA round. Um, that the applications are um, available in the early part of January. Um, the turnaround is relatively quick. Um, it's maybe like a two to three week period of the town being able to respond. Um, but, the, but the work probably would begin earnestly in the middle of, um, in the beginning of March. Um, so it's like a two month period where the town responds to the DLTA request and um, the executive director um, chooses the projects that would get funded. Okay, so under the exception for things that were not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance, I think we can talk about this a little bit and sort of, Ken had mentioned whether um, this could be something part of a this could be a grant topic, or we also had talked about the uh, housing development plan. Um, so I don't know if we just want to knock that around a little bit. Do we do we want do we want to try to push this forward some other way, or just let it? let it pass, let it die for now. 
what, what would we be applying for is a question on what grounds well i think what you know what bill is alluding to and what um the historically and i'm not quite sure if the executive director is changing um you know the policy by which some of these projects are funded or these planning projects are funded um historically it's been um land use and um municipal services and um having done most of the land use projects under dlta um my time has been funding um bylaw amendments so you know if if the the board is looking at their inclusionary zoning bylaw that's something that can be funded through this um it is a priority under um increasing housing um in addition to a housing production plan as i mentioned earlier um so i think that they're the the approach of the board and i think um i'm not i i think the request I haven't been uh, attached to the technicalities if the request is coming from the planning board or from the town administrator. Um, I think that there may be some priorities that um, you as the board may have to address with the administrator. But um, historically, I have worked on housing production plans, open space plans, um, you know, some of these other um, amendments to the to bylaws. Um, in addition to zoning review. Um, so I think there's a multitude of ways to approach um, this particular issue if if the board wants to to you know put this aside and and look at it holistically and in some other way. I, I suppose that a payment in lieu is one if we were doing a housing development plan, inclusionary zoning is part of that and the payment in lieu is part of that um but i agree it might be better just to take a you know get out of the weeds and maybe take a longer distance view of it and let let just find out how legislation makes it is making its way through boston yeah, so not, uh, even if we got a grant I wonder how much more we would look at those topics. How much more in depth we would get get to it. It kind of seems like we're at a at a place where we've got the best ideas that we got from around the area. Um, none of them, by any means, are great ideas, but they would work. But maybe just kind of. You know, I don't see that we're in a hurry. Like Bill says, we've been we've had this law in the books for a years. while. If anybody comes in, the law is in the zoning bylaw. The only thing that we need to adopt is a regulation. And if somebody were to come in with a subdivision preliminary, we could probably adopt a regulation in a matter of a few weeks. Or certainly a month we could get it adopted. We have a bunch of ideas to have something in the regulation to address it. And by the time it's fully developed, it can always be changed and they could comply if it's a better thing down the road. So I don't I don't see that we're in dire need to adopt the regulation right now. I agree, Jim. I I mean we've we've been beating this around and no, we, the overall the overall goal is to make more affordable housing. We just looked at a lot here. The minimum lot is going to go for 140,000 and it's going to go up to 200,000. Lots are not coming down and interest rates are going to be going up. Lumber, it's come down a little bit, but it's, it's spiked. Everything is against us. That's to, why we have to look up. We have to look up three stories, four stories, affordable housing. That's what, that's, that's. You, you tell me where to put it. Uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll tell you if it's a good idea. I'm just telling you, it's the only way to do it. But, but, yeah. You keep, you keep uh, pitching uh, about the, the cost of a lot. 
Yeah. Well, you're not going to have oh. to use a whole bunch of lots if you go if you go up. But, but you know, Jacques Penet. The, huh? the, the, the bottom line is we're not. We'll get Mark Dunn to design the building. We're, we're, we're not facing a crisis <laughs> here with anybody coming in. Exactly right. We Jim. have a little bit of time, and I said if even if somebody was to come in with a subdivision, the law is on the books. That is addressed. They're not grandfathered. And the regulation could be adopted in a relatively short period of time to address the fee. In the meantime, there are two things they can do that are on the books right in front of them. And especially since um, if we get a developer in that triggers this, presumably someone who has some experience in developing, they may come in with an idea for a plan that they've found somewhere else and they'll be happy to make their proposal subject to our adopting a regulation. Right. Good point. So well, I mean, someone come, excuse me, go ahead. Mike, I just want to answer you quite, uh, I mean, you're too young to remember a place in Boston called Columbia Point. And the answer yeah. to housing was to make it higher. And, and that was, became one of the most drug infested crime ridden place that it had to be torn down. And well, you know, you're talking about Hadley now, it's drug infested, okay? Well, so it's not gonna change anything. You have two stories there. I look out the window, I can see the lights out there. We have, we have all buildings. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know what you're Jim, Jim and, and Bill were kind of thinking like I'm thinking. I'm just trying to find a solution. Maybe there's not a solution. So I, I, you can't you can't get, go around building affordable housing if you're going to have to pay 140 thousand a lot. Well, you have some lot available. Why don't you just donate it? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. okay. I, I'm maybe gonna I make, will. Maybe, maybe right. I will. Okay. I get a I'm going to make a motion to close the public hearing on the payment in lieu option without adopting any regulations. I second it. I want to second it. <laughs> <laughs> and we, so I just want to make sure that we're clear on this bill. So that when a time comes, we will have, we will have to repost and readopt the regulation if somebody comes in with a subdivision. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. All right. If they want to take advantage of the payment in lieu. If they want to take a payment in lieu. But we As have several ideas on how to use a payment in lieu. Great. We have a motion and a second to close this hearing without adopting. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Good. That takes Thank care of this God. one for the time being. <laughs> we've closed the books on 2021. There's been a longer public hearing we've had. We've actually <laughs> talked about it as opposed to just continue and continue. Thank you, Ken. There go the billable hours, Ken. <laughs> okay. What's the next thing we should send Ken to work on? Well, we had a couple of things on the- uh, yeah, what, what was in the contract? On the work program. I think we were talking about re, uh, overhauling the uh, special permit language. That's been there for a while. Gonna pull up scope um yeah re review all sections of hadley zoning bylaw that involve the issuance of special permits and determine feasibility of consolidating and standardization of language specifications and requirements where possible to prevent redundancies and inconsistencies and it should take you about a half an hour i <laughs> would also like to try to figure out a way to um I have developed a lot of boilerplate language in my decisions, and I end up reading them all out all the time. Uh, and I don't know if um, we could adopt, uh, I suppose we could adopt regulations and, and call them the standard conditions and not have to repeat them. For sure. I think that would be um, great. Yeah. Yeah. The experiences that I've had with regards to, consistent um, conditions on a special permit um, is that a planning board will adopt um, their like standard conditions. It's there on paper. 
um, and the applicant or the, the person that would be getting that approved decision um, would be aware of what those standard conditions are. And I, I don't think you necessarily need to, to spell them out when you're going through your approval process. So if there happens to be standard conditions as, um, you know, Bill, you probably have had this list, which probably are very typical of other communities when they're approving, you know, um, special permits. Um, I think that that, you know, if if that if if it's in one place, I think you know it could be helpful um, to to look at that again. I think that's a great idea. Clear up a lot of things. That's probably better than uh, working on a special permit language right off, Bill, because mm -hmm. it would just save a lot of baloney and all the typing up and all the decisions and everything. So would that be adopted by a regulation or uh, would we adopt regulations? I don't think we really have authority to adopt regulations in the special permit language as it now reads, or can we just vote to do that? I think it's, it's more so just a policy of the board. Um, in the experiences that I've had with the planning boards that I work with, there are typical conditions, like the first 12 conditions are related to construction, pre-construction, post-construction. And um, they just live on all the decisions of that permit. And then there are some very specific conditions that um, the planning board would put on that decision. So I think it's maybe more of a policy. Um, we can, I, I can explore to see whether or not within the language, if you want to amend um, a, plan, a, a zoning bylaw to suggest that in your special permit process, there are certain standard conditions that will just automatically be attached, um, such as this, this, and this, you can, uh, you can maybe go that way, but at the same time, I think having the planning board do that during the special permit application process probably is a, is is a little better instead of having to address that within a you know a yeah, zoning I, bylaw. So what I, basically a lot of what my standard conditions are are tracking the bylaw because you have to do what the bylaw says and and we've had occasions in the past where someone would say well it didn't say that in the uh, it didn't say compliance with the bylaws required. Uh, so I just did what I wanted on a couple of things. Um, and uh, yeah, that was frustrating. So a lot of what I do is paraphrase the bylaw anyway. But um, uh, maybe I'll just send you some of my uh, templates. And, yeah, please uh, do. I, and I think we can, you know, look through that and see, you know, what the best course is for okay. the board, whether or, whether or not that's just a policy um, that the board can, whenever there's a special permit address or even a site plan no. approval. So part, part of the disconnect is that what we have in the bylaw for special permit actually um, appears in the section that, it, that uh, creates the Zoning Board of Appeals, okay. which was a special permit granting authority. Mm -hmm. And then we just added on, grafted on some other bylaws that said, and the planning board shall be the special permit granting authority for this. Okay. And we've been following both combination of state law and what is in the, the bylaw. But um, yeah, I think there, there's room for both to be overhauled. And we probably should loop the ZBA in on it too. Um, but um but okay, I think the really short-term project was is if we can have a a uh, a process for adopting standard clauses so they don't have to be reiterated each time. Now, I've never, I don't think I've ever attended a public hearing of yours where you're acting on a special permit. Um, because I'm usually on your off your off weeks right. where you know it's just an appointment with you all, um, so I'd be interested to see you know the process by which you arrive, and I think that you you maybe acted on a permit last at the last meeting. And maybe we did. I that okay. 
and that was fairly fairly short. Okay. Uh, and it was all contained in one meeting. So uh, okay. January 18th, Ken, we're issuing a we're hearing a uh, it's called Energy Storage LLC or something like that. And they're applying for basically three special permits that night. Oh, I think I, I caught a little bit of it um, in, in within the context of your conversation with regards to battery. Right, um, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, they're looking for uh, solar energy storage batteries, uh, business use or uh, use in aquifer, and site plan approval all at the same time. Okay. So. Okay. I mean, I probably will watch that anyway, because solar is a topic that I've been following closely with some of the communities in the region. Yeah. Um, and this will be our first solar, first battery only solar installation yeah it's a it's a five megawatt battery it's not a small but these last ones have been a little small battery store this one is five megawatts so this it's as big as the so the, the storage is as big as the is, is basically our biggest the solar uh, size okay yeah that's a large one so anyway okay so it's well, Ken's with us. Can I make a motion to request um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission DLTA, that's District Local Technical Assistance, in developing a housing production plan? And then I can take care of, I can coordinate with uh, the town administrator about how the application gets in. But I think if we just vote to do it, um, then no, whenever the application finally surfaces, we can move more quickly. Are we creating one or are we editing a, an existing one? We'd be creating a housing production plan. We do we not have, have no, one. We have no HPP, okay. Second. I would, yeah. Is that a second? second? That was yeah. a second from Mike, he beat me to it. Oh, okay. Anyways, I just want to make sure we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Very good. And then Ken will now, now work on uh, putting your conditions somehow or set language together somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have kind of a petty thing to discuss, but would it be would it be petty? Would it be uh, uh, deleterious to uh, create like a deadline? We're you know we're two weeks and sometimes three weeks between planning board, and uh, not all of us are retired. Uh, it'd be nice if people could get things in a day before, you know, so that we'd have Monday night to actually read things instead of I, I, agree. Come, out, I agree. I come out of you know I come out of work on Tuesday, and there's all these emails because everybody got it in at the last minute, and so then I'm I feel unprepared because I haven't been able to review the stuff. I I will do that for you. I apologize okay. for the lateness. Um, uh, you're not that, the only one. No, I know. And one. having having been a planner before and having to interact with volunteer planning board members, um, you know, they also address that um, mm -hmm. issue with with um, either additions to the application or mm -hmm. revisions coming in at two hours before the meeting, not having the yeah. time to review it. Yeah. Um, that could be a policy of the board, um, mm -hmm. you know, and should the board and its regulations uh, in the future want to address that? I mean, I think that that's something that you can look at. Yeah. I think it should be the Friday before the meeting, you know, give us some time. Yeah. So I can, um, 
I can change the language in the agenda. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's it's a first come first serve for the open session. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't require or offer appointments, but we can, well, some people come in with just little questions. Right. So if I don't have, want- Right, if you have plans or materials to be reviewed by the board, we'd like to see them in advance. Yeah. So some to the effect that if you have plans that need to be reviewed or signed, they need to be in at least, say, uh, you know, 48 hours before the meeting. Well, I kind of do like Mike's idea about Friday because 48 hours then puts the pressure on Bill to get everything out to us. But that's well, up to yeah. you, Bill. Yeah, well, yeah, pick pick a reasonable time frame. 48, 72. Yeah. You know, well, uh, I, I don't want to get in trouble with the town treasurer. I think that uh, telling people by get it in by close of business on Friday. Yeah. yeah. But, okay. Five o'clock so Friday. Won't or we won't hear it. There's yeah. no appeals. Yeah. Or you can come talk to us and we'll say, we need to see information. You can bring it to our next meeting. That way, you know, you... It's gonna be, there's probably some way to word that, that basically says, you know, we'll listen to anything you have to say, but if you have visuals or anything else for us to review, um, we need to see it by, you know, the close of business on Friday, the week before. I can I can share with with the board too when I was um, or perhaps was, supporting documents. How's that? Right. Um, I had a development review calendar, so a schedule of all of the planning board's meetings, and it provided a schedule of when public notices would need to go out, um, and for depending on you know, and it was literally an Excel spreadsheet that had uh, calculations for when certain dates would be. Um, but the board had suggested that by Monday, if they had a planning board on Wednesday, uh, a Wednesday meeting, that by Monday close of business, they had to have all the materials. Otherwise, as Mark suggested, the applicant can maybe, you know, if they had a scheduled item on the agenda, the applicant could address it, but it would be up to the planning board whether or not they wanted to, you know, wanted more material or or we'll review it at the next meeting right. is that written down somewhere yeah i think i let me look at the language i i, I definitely have it um okay. and i'll share that with you i mean i think close the day on, on because we have a tuesday meeting close of business on friday is a reasonable time to get stuff in you know, most 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 people aren't working over the weekend, so if they're drawing it up on Monday, that's kind of what you call putting it off to the last minute. <laughs> yeah, I just I just wanted to be you know leave room for something like Paul Benjamin to come in and ask for a release of a lot, right? Um, you know, I, I think the general question, the release of a lot, those are fine because that's all been drawn up and approved in prior and you're looking at something that's basically history. Mm -hmm. so if somebody comes in with an a and R or a change to a, a subdivision or a change to an existing project, you know, and they have drawings for it, they can get that in on a Friday because they, yeah. they, have, they have hard copies of some sort. So, you know, general questions like, hey, can I do this? You know, that can be discussed like, uh, you know, a few of them that came in tonight. The lady mm -hmm. with the dog pound and stuff, I mean, yep. she doesn't have any drawings to look at. So we're just kind of, you know, saying, we're giving her general direction. Yeah, you need this, you need this, but she's not applying or doing anything. We're not approving or saying right. anything other than, other than answering some questions. 
And then, Bill, you don't have to give them the permission to share a screen because you should already have all their materials. <laughs> Although, honestly, I would rather that they, they come prepared with their own materials. Yes, yes. yes, um, yes. It, it, it's a great feeling of power, but being <laughs> able to have them show you with the mouse where things are. Exactly, exactly. Um, but, um, yeah, that's the one thing I miss about meeting in person is not being able to haul out the laser pointers. and. <laughs> Well, what's this over here? Yeah, yeah. Will we ever be back to that? We'll find out in April when this when this process runs out. What the what the governor decides. What comes after Omicron? Gamma. <laughs> I didn't take Greek. No idea. <laughs> It'll be Zeta. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think Joe had to learn Greek back when. Uh, could be. They were teaching uh, physics in Greek at Amherst College. No, the, the only way you knew Greek is by fraternities were still at Amherst then. I found out that Omicron was uh, in the old Greek, it meant small O. O micron. Okay, Ken, um, next meeting. Um, you want to make it the 18th of January when we have our special permit? Because that's not going to be, I don't think, a super long hearing. And that's the only thing we've got on the agenda for that night, right now. That should be fine. Okay. MLK plus one. <laughs> I got to remember to post the agenda early for that one, the uh, the Monday holidays. Mm. Oh, Martin Luther King Day, yes. Amherst Town Council approved uh, zoning for the downtown parking garage. Maybe they could put a library in the parking garage. Yeah. Mm. Build, it, build it tall enough, you could have affordable housing up there. It's a good year not to be in. Amherst politics. And the Harvard professor was convicted of lying about his relations with the Chinese that just popped across the screen. Oh. I told you, I warned you last week, two weeks ago. <laughs> you know, okay. if we were meeting in person, you would not be able to be uh, multitasking like this. No, no. Uh. It just pops up on my iPad. Uh, he'll probably have an Apple Watch next time we uh, he'll have his news feed on it. Do we have anything yeah. else, Jim? Yeah. Yes, I got some invoices to pay here. Um, let's see, I got a, two invoices for the Gazette. One for, let's see, which one is this? This is for, this is for Handrich on uh, Moody Bridge Road. Legal notices total 334.70. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next one I have is for the legal notice for the one that we have in January. Right, uh, for, for the uh, yeah, for the solar batteries we were talking about. This one is for 374.08. That's up off of Breckenridge, correct? Yes, motion to approve. Second, so all in favor, aye, aye, aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. And the last one is the budget. I got to get the budget in, I think before the end of the month. And given with everything going on, um, I'm of the opinion we just level fund it again. Any comments? I, are we good on PVPC? Yeah, it's still 7,500 for PVPC. I'd like to get that higher. 
but um with the current climate sure you know should we ask for more for that one i think uh, we should ken puts in a lot of work don't you ken i'm you know jesus maybe we should go to how about instead of a loop, last time we tried to double it how about if we just go to ten thousand? yeah yeah that that's what i was thinking as well okay The, uh, the legal notice is we got a fixed budget on that, but we just keep, because we bring money in, then we, we just get transfers out. We just get that uh, in uh, amended all the time whenever we start running the budget low because we bring, we're bring we bringing in most of the money to pay for it. So that has never been a problem. So we can just leave that one alone. Wasn't so there I, some, I'm sorry. Wasn't there some talk about some administrative person that might have some time for us? Is that going to impact our budget? Or? Well, we've got um, administ We've got fifty nine hundred. We've got almost six thousand dollars of an administrative assistant that we can utilize. Okay. Um, I believe Is that right, Bill. Uh, yes that that has that's completely freed up for us now. Okay. Um, we do have, there's someone working in uh, Board of Health who would like to pick up some extra time. Okay. Um, so maybe just for budgeting purposes, uh, why don't we double that to 12,000? Because right now, if we started someone January 1, we'd have 6,000. If we, um, um, at least for discussion purposes, let's uh, let's bump that to twelve thousand. Okay, and we'll uh, we'll maybe at our first January meeting, which I don't think we have anything else scheduled for, we can uh, we can discuss that a little more. Okay, January fourth. Yeah. Okay. So six. Let's see. Six thousand. Is the state still on schedule for the Route Nine project? Has COVID Im impacted that schedule? Are we going to have to weigh in on, or is that all? That's permitted. They they permit themselves. Okay. We don't really have anything to say on Unless that. I do believe that they have they've recorded most of their takings. Um I'm not I'm not recalling when they said they when they anticipated going out to bid. So what they've been doing now is, is mostly office stuff, paper stuff. Um, at some point, they will be going out to bid, but um, I'm not sure when. And are they doing the project on the, on the bridge down on 47 too? Because I remember there were three projects we told them not to align them. <laughs> they are not going to be aligned. Uh, you know, they've, they've gotten through the... Um, the rotary or yeah um, roundabout whatever roundabout at uh, the bridge yeah um, they were i think they agreed to postpone the uh, the bridge off of bay road on bay road yeah the port, port river bridge okay and, right. um, but they are going ahead as as i understand it they There'll be construction next next season. Oh, good. But I don't know that they've even gone out to bid yet. No. Okay, so just, just to review the budget, we're going to re increase administrative assistance to 12,000. Planning board salary stay the same. Planning services will go to 10,000. And all the rest, the advertising, training, office supplies and dues will stay the same. And the budget will increase to, I believe, twenty six thousand three twenty six. If my numbers, if my addition is right. How much do we have for education in there? No. Thirteen dollars and twenty five cents. 
We Would just you? learned from Joe. <laughs> Pro bono. Who's up? Who's up for our election next year, twenty twenty two? That would be me. That would be you. Okay. Am I allowed to say I'm? I'll vote for you. No, I probably shouldn't say that. Um, the uh, yeah, the nomination papers should be out sometime in January. Right. The uh, so that that is our budget. Just want to make sure we have a motion to. So Vote just to, go back for a second. Mike asked, uh, and I think seriously about what what is the budget for education? education. Um, training and meetings is two hundred and fifty dollars. Fifty dollars ahead. No total. Right. All right. Let's up that to five hundred. Uh, traveling, traveling to Worcester's doubled. <laughs> okay. I mean, we've only spent. So far, less than hundred dollars this year. There weren't any opportunities out there. <laughs> I was probably on some zooms or. Wait, seriously, you want to go to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't do it. Then you know, I just if we start trying, I always like to go to Worcester to that thing they had at Holy Cross. Yeah, okay, so make it five hundred. Yeah. Okay. I think all the all the Ch Chapa stuff has been free, hasn't it? Or maybe, maybe there is a fee. There, there is a fee for uh, one of the programs, um, and um, yeah, there are fee, there are fees for programs out there. Um, Ken, you know that that Citizen Planner Training Consortium that yes. I know that you, uh, PVPC sponsors one session. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we wanted to attend others, there would be a fee, wouldn't there? Yeah. And so, you know, this was obviously prior to COVID where we would host um, two sessions at PVPC and we hosted in name um, this year doing fair housing. Um, but um, Mike was alluding to the um, larger conference in usually held in March at Holy Cross that's the big spring conference at uh, for CPTC, the Citizen Planner Training Collaborative. Um, but you're right, Bill, that um, right now, CPTC is obviously holding virtual um, Zoom, um, and those are $20, I think, ahead. Um, so mm -hmm. at the moment, and more than likely, that probably will stay the same, um, even if we go back to um, in person. And then there was something else. What is the, um, what's the organization you belong to, Ken? Um, the, uh, is that American, chapter? Which the, the, the Massachusetts chapter of the American Planning Association? Yes. <clears throat> I think um, I came across something. The APA does have a uh, reduced membership rate for, um, elected people that is partly for the APA, and partly for the Massachusetts chapter of the APA. Um, and uh, I just looked at that sort of in passing once. Uh, it's not inexpensive, but it uh, uh, might not be a bad uh, investment to make. How much, do you remember idea how much it was, Bill? Uh, I'm going to say it was something, uh, there was like a flat fee and then uh, $40 per board member. Um, I'll, uh, where did I have that? I'm just wondering if I put, if I bookmarked something. Um, and probably didn't. Um, so, um, I'm going to, I'll quickly share the screen bill. Um, I do, I just pulled that up. Um, okay. So I'm on the, I'm on the board of the Massachusetts chapter. Um, but I believe you're talking about this one. I'm not familiar with this, but, um, it sounds as if, 
Oh uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, you can pay the hundred twenty one dollar fee for the board, and then sixty eight dollars per elected official, and you would get the ability to to utilize. Um, you would each get a, a membership number, and you could sign up for a conference. Um, you can also participate and get um, some good resources um, of best practices around the country for planning. Um, in addition to what just came out this year, and I'm gonna you know start probably sharing as I can um, a new land use um, for Massachusetts document um, that is, was done by um, Bob Ritchie and Bob Mitchell um, for land use and zoning issues around Massachusetts um, that just came out this year. So um, it could be a good resource for individual planning board members or- That would, that would absorb most of the $500. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not- the kind of guy that's going to log in and look for something. I wanted to say, hey, why don't you come? Let's pay it, you know? No, I think we're being reasonable with the, it's not like we're asking to go to the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, but that's put on by the University of Honolulu. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, you're going to quarantine for two weeks if you want to go there. Uh, that's a lot of bathing suits. Yeah. So are we good with what we got? Increase good. administrative assistance to twelve thousand, planning services to ten, training to five hundred, for a total budget of roughly twenty six thousand five seventy six. Okay, that's a good starting point. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Anybody opposed? Motion pass. We'll, that's what we'll submit. Okie dokie. That's all I have. Anybody have anything else? You want to head over, Zeke? No. No. And to all a good night. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Christmas See you night. next year. Happy Kwanzaa. Good night. Good night. Good night. No, wait a minute. Motion to adjourn. Oh. Oh yes. Yes. So moved. Do you have Sorry. a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. And meeting is history. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ken. <laughs>